Hi, good evening, everyone. And I want to welcome you to the Institute of Politics and um, welcome Eric Erickson, who somehow made it through the storm, <laughs> and Professor Charles Lipson here tonight um, to talk about the fault lines in the GOP. Uh, Li Elizabeth Green will be making a formal introduction, but I just am um, really grateful you all are here tonight. And I want to tell you about a couple things we have coming up at the IOP. Building on tonight's discussion, next Wednesday, we'll take a look at the Super Tuesday results in both parties and analyze what they mean in a panel led by McKay Coppins of BuzzFeed. That'll be a really fun event. On March 7th, Mara Kiesling will join us to discuss LGBTQ rights. And on March 9th, we'll have a panel on free speech on college campuses. Um, and I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Green. She is a third year from Boston, Mass., a law, letters, and society ma major. And she will be introducing tonight's program. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Green, and I'd like to introduce our guest, Eric Erickson. Mr. Erickson is one of the most influential voices of the conservative movement. He is an, the editor of The Resurgent, a contributor for Fox News, a syndicated newspaper columnist, and radio talk show host for Atlanta-based WSB, one of the nation's largest talk show radio stations. Today, he will be discussing the ideological divide in the Republican Party and its members the rise and sustained success of outside challengers like businessman Donald Trump and Senator Ted Cruz have cluttered the path to victory for establishment candidates. Will this election be the final race of the GOP as we know it? Joining Mr. Erickson is UChicago political si uh, science professor and co-director of the program on international politics, economics, and security, Charles Lipson. Please welcome me in joining Mr. Eric Erickson. So um, welcome all. Um, it's great to have you here. We're going to have a, a little conversation for a while, and then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A with preference, uh, you know, with first priority uh, to students. We were waiting for a while for <coughs> uh, State's Attorney Alvarez in, uh, to come so she could interrupt uh, the talk and get even, <laughs> get even but uh, we decided to go on. Uh, uh, without her, and I'm really glad you're doing uh, a free speech uh, talk. Um, uh, there are too many snowflakes on campus, fortunately not at IOP. Um, the, uh, let me start by, uh, by saying the traditional view uh, about uh, the Republican Party in the last few years has been that there are three legs on the stool. There are uh, uh, social conservatives who care about issues uh, like uh, marriage, family, abortion, uh, that sort of thing. And you might uh, uh, add gun rights to that, although they don't fit quite so easily. Um, uh, there are people who are, uh, and uh, there, the voices for them would be people uh, like Rick Santorum, who won the Iowa primary the last time, or Mike Huckabee. I mean, these are sort of distilled voices out of that. Uh, there are people who are in the more libertarian, or uh, if not libertarian, roll back the role of uh, the federal government. And there are quite a lot of Republicans in that. But the, the most, uh, the purest uh, voice in the uh, previous president, you might not have heard of him, but Rand Paul ran for president. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there uh, are people who believe in a strong foreign policy. That's virtually all Republicans believe in a strong foreign policy. But the strongest, the most sort of pure voices of that uh, are uh, associated with neoconservatives. Most Republicans agree to some extent with all, with all of these, but not all. There are quite a, there are quite a number of people who uh, are fiscal conservatives and strong on foreign policy, but are either libertarian or very liberal on social issues. There are quite a lot of students that I run into who are like that. But anyway, those are the three pillars. So um, as they say on Passover, why is this election different? <laughs> uh, it, it's primarily different because you have a lot of Republican leaders in Washington who made a ton of promises to their base and others, 
and failed to keep all of them after taking money from voters. Uh, not just votes, but a lot of money. Uh, Eric Cantor, among others, in 2012 and 2013, uh, ran direct mail messaging campaigns to conservatives across the country, saying, if you give us the House and Senate in 2014, we will repeal Obamacare. Uh, he's no longer there. And he, people became very angry. But the Republican Party, I think, as well lost their way in that they became the party of, of Lincoln and Reagan and saying that the problem was government, and finally decided that the problem wasn't government, it was Democrats in charge of government, and began shifting policy preferences away from a lot of people in the heartland. That's a very clear uh, answer. I thought one decisive moment in that, an early shot, was when Tom DeLay, who was one of the leading Republican figures in the House, when the Republicans won the House under Gingrich, he basically told the lobbying organizations in Washington, what we want you to do now is hire more Republican right. lobbyists. It was called the K Street Project. Yeah, so DeLay did this and embedded a lot of Republicans within the power structure in Washington in K Street, and then they became much more addicted to the money from K Street. Uh, it is with both parties now. I mean, there, there is a common, I think, a common grievance between the Tea Party elements of the right and the Occupy elements of the left that Washington is stacked against the people and picks winners and losers. And the differences in outcomes, I think the, the Tea Party effort would like to change some of the laws in the system, and as would Occupy, but there's a, a, a punish the rich element to the Occupy that's not shared by the Tea Party. And Washington, both parties ignored that. It's a lot easier in America these days for a major corporation to hire a lobbyist to go to Washington and get a carve out from the loop from the tax code than it is to innovate against a competitor. And so Wall Street is no longer aligned with Main Street in the way it used to be for a core part of the Republican existence. I have a very easy way for all of you to see that change. When uh, I was younger, and a congressman decided to retire, um, he or she would always come back home. They would come back to their district. You can hardly name people who, who come back home now, right. including all the Republican leaders. Their base is Washington. And it's not only because that's where the TV is and so forth. They're all lobbyists. Right. Uh, the... It, Jeb Bush's failing campaign, one of the best ideas that he had was to say that he would have changed the lobbying reform efforts that a Republican member of Congress could not even serve as a consulting consultant to a business that did lobbying for at least five years. Uh, it, it was, I thought, was a great idea. You do see this revolving door now. It's not just congressmen. I'm not actually in favor of term limits for members of Congress because I think in states where that's happened, what you see is, is the rush to get greedy just happens faster. Uh, I actually think you should term limit the staff, not the members of Congress, uh, because you do have this revolving door uh, building access, and the staff handles so much of the agenda now, it's the staffers who persuade the congressman. Morton Blackwell, a friend of mine who runs the Leadership Institute in Washington, has a list of, they're like Luther's 99 theses, except they're for politics. And number one is personnel is politics. Good personnel is good politics. And what you see is a lot of congressmen rely on people from K Street to come in. One of the greatest examples of this is a young freshman senator from Florida named Marco Rubio got surrounded with people from K Street, one of them being a lobbyist who had worked for Dick Cheney, whose name was Cesar Conda, very good guy, but Conda came into his office pushing immigration reform. Rubio signed on board his plan for immigration reform despite the protests internally of a number of his staffers, and had he not done that, we may not be seeing Rubio in the mess he's in right now. It's very interesting because I do think there is what I, two years ago I called a quiet fury, and now it's a very vocal fury uh, throughout the country about these, um, uh, about this kind of uh, insider baseball that both parties uh, play in Washington. Well, because of the internet, people are much more educated about it now as well. They used to be able to hide what goes on, and they can't anymore. Well. That, I think that that's, uh, that that's fascinating, that, that uh, there's just more transparency. I think there's also a view on the Republican side, and I'd love to hear your views on this, that 
um, that the bureaucracy, uh, a bureaucracy uh, in motion tends to stay in motion. And it will always continue to grow. And what you can do if you're Ronald Reagan and you come in, you can slow the growth a little bit. But unless you uh, take a, a sort of cleaver to it, um, you will be left when the Republicans go out of office with another Democrat that comes in and the growth uh, simply resumes. But that leaves you with a problem, Eric, besides the problem of uh, can you do it? It means that the Republicanism is no longer Burkean. It's no longer let's reform things but keep things largely the way they are. Let's do something much more radical than that. How do you respond to people who think that there's a kind of wisdom in Burkean conservatism? I think that Burkean conservatism in and of itself is, it serves a purpose. Uh, I do think that what we see is a stability in a system. When you contrast the American system right now, let, let's say worst case scenario for all of us is we get a President Trump. Uh, and, and I do mean that would be the worst case scenario. I, I believe that a, an election of Donald Trump would kind of be the undermining of everything the founders put into the Constitution to stop so someone I'm like that. So putting you down as undecided? Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I'm undecided between leaving the country or voting third party if, if it comes to Trump, I guess. Uh, I, I won't leave the country. Cuba's but, now open. Yes, you Cuba's know. now yeah. open, yes. Go from, you know, it, 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 it's just deeply ironic that we have two guys running for president whose families fled oppressive regimes and they're running against a guy who wants to build a border and, and laughs about beating up protesters. Um, just appalling. Uh, nonetheless, um, when you look at the Roman Empire as it began to come off the wheels, the thing that kept it going for so long despite repeated assassinations of emperors is that they built a solid bureaucracy. So the taxes were still being collected, the roads were still being paved, the buildings were still being built, the plumbing was still being installed, but over time even that began to collapse. Uh, the bureaucracy ironically could save the country from a President Trump, but at the same time, uh, the bureaucracy as it becomes more Washington and less provincial um, begins to become more homogenized in a way the founders didn't want. Uh, we've lost concepts of federalism in this country that I think both parties should go back to. We are a, a deeply divided nation, which we can be if we're not expected to be homogenized. It's an interesting point because for many years, uh, uh, it was a statement among lawyers who practiced uh, constitutional law that if you had to go to the Supreme Court with an argument that relied on uh, the responsibility of the states, not the federal government, you just lost. That was it. Right. Yeah, we have devalued the states. We see these arguments now about, oh, the, the Wisconsin or, or Wyoming, which barely has any people, has as many votes in the Senate as California. Yes, by design. The founders in the country, and, and I, I give this speech all the time. You'll have to forgive me for sounding preachy on this. and I am in seminary. The founders bled and died for causes that we find abstract now. Uh, we find abstract the Third Amendment uh, housing soldiers in your home. Uh, why the hell is that in the in the Bill of Rights? It was a very real thing to the founders. Uh, we find abstract this idea of putting a, a Second Amendment in the Constitution, a right to keep and bear arms, and what does it actually mean and who does it apply to? It was actually something very real to the founders. Uh, the founders' grandfathers fought in the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Uh, they, they knew, they heard the stories. We are very far removed from that, and it becomes abstract. There are reasons things are in the Constitution we may not appreciate, like the Electoral College, but the founders had a real reason for that. And as we moved along, there are these ideas that, well, the Senate, Wyoming shouldn't have as many votes in the Senate as, as California is. Well, that's what the House of Representatives is for. The Senate was supposed to represent states, not people. We have forgotten this idea that states are supposed to be semi-sovereign entities, not just administrative uh, subdivisions of the federal government. You know, when that actually changed, this is, this about as long ago left the, uh, left the harbor, but that really changed when the Senate went to direct elections. Mm -hmm. When you had to, when the Senate was elected by the legislature in, in Illinois, a very distinguished body, um, <laughs> you, uh, the senator. What prison did that vote happen at? <laughs> the uh, the uh, senators were in effect responsible to their states mm -hmm. in a way 
that just right. permanently changed. It also diluted national politics because state elections mattered much more than federal elections at the time. So imagine super PACs these days if they had to deal with 50 states as opposed to just the federal government. The concentration of power and political influence was much more diluted. Interestingly enough, Scalia um, came to my law school when I was uh, there and a student asked him what would be the single biggest reform that could ever happen and his suggestion was repealing that amendment to directly elect senators. That's really interesting. I had lunch with Scalia right in the next room, just a group of faculty. He was by then on the Supreme Court, but of course he had been a faculty um, member here and as everyone said about him, he was just an incredibly fascinating person at the individual level. Not only whip smart, I mean you would expect that uh, of uh, uh, a University of Chicago professor, if not a Supreme Court justice, <laughs> but, um, but he was just a fascinating guy. You said something about the Glorious Revolution, and I'm glad you did, and I'll, I'll tell you a little um, a story about the problem. You're assuming, rightly, I think, that the country has lost a sense of its common history. Mm -hmm. and. Um, for several years, I taught a course called Core Western Values. Now, it wasn't always rah-rah, but it was free speech, property rights, government by consent, religious toleration, the big elements. And we would always have uh, some period of time devoted to what I call the dark side. It could be slavery, it could be discrimination, uh, whatever. Um, and I decided uh, to ask the students, it was a seminar, most of my course big, this is a seminar. And I decided to ask uh, the students um, who had accompanied Lewis and Clark on their expedition. How many of the students know who accompanied Lewis and Clark? Who accompanied Lewis and Clark? Sacagawea. Okay. And there were a lot of hands that went up. By the oh. way, I often accidentally say Pocahontas, sorry. But yes, I know the answer, but. I mean, she's the mascot of the Cleveland Indians. The, <laughs> um, the um, Sacagawea. Then I ask students, can you name any event or document other than the Magna Carta that is a source of our liberties as embodied in the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. Can you name any document? Hands down. Nobody's naming any. Finally, a hand goes up. And uh, somebody uh, says, uh, English rights of man. OK? And I said, where were you educated? And he said, Singapore. And I then asked the class, how many of you think that knowing Sacagawea, a guide who helped people explore, or even for that matter, knowing Lewis and Clark, not just their guide, but knowing them, is more important than knowing the fundamental foundations of American liberty? And then I said a phrase that none of them would recognize, of course, today. You've been robbed of your birthright. And they wouldn't recognize it because, of course, the language of the uh, uh, a biblical language is no longer part of their birthright. But I think you've put your finger on something very important. Our teaching of history has denuded it of political history and has stripped it of a sense of common history, which we can have without depreciating the problems of slavery and the struggles that, that minorities had and the treatment of the Irish when they came to this country and all the rest. But we have lost a sense of our common background. Oh, I think we have. Uh, when you divide our history into ethnicities and grievances, eventually what you see, frankly, is what's starting to crop up on the Trump side. You, you have uh, a Black Lives Matters grievance. Now, I guess I read yesterday there's an Asian Lives Matters grievance. The Donald Trump campaign is White Lives Matters grievance. I mean, the go online and see the number of people 
who believe in, in there is white oppression or what have you. Uh, it's not just a, a, a branch of Republican oppression gravity. Oppression of whites or yes, oppression by whites? Oppression of whites. Uh, I mean, the, the number of people who have, have come after me in the last three days who have uh, SWAT stickers in their Twitter profiles, among other things, um, they, and they're gravitated towards Donald Trump. Those I, I are was, pretty rare among my emails. Well, yes. Uh, um, listen, uh, you know, in I guess it was in 2008, I banned Ron Paul supporters from my website at the time, uh, Red State, because we noticed a peculiar habit that if I were to put up a post that said I was going to the bathroom, uh, someone would reply immediately, watch out for the Jews while you're there. And they were all Ron Paul supporters, so we banned them. Did and I actually met you in the bathroom. Oh, did you? <laughs> Let's not talk about that one. Yes. Let's not talk about that one. Um, and I wound up getting put on a neo-Nazi website and literally had someone call my house. They put my phone number up before it was unlisted. And all they asked before hanging up is if I was married to the whore of Babylon. That's actually someone called me to ask me that. And I haven't had that encounter since until the rise of Trump supporters. And uh, on a, 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 I forget the name, Storm something website where you have the, the eagle with the little medallion underneath. It doesn't have a, a, a SWAT stick. It has something else. And th there's this rise of green culture that in the country. you're seeing that in Europe. Yes. And, and with much greater political weight. Of course, here it's quite marginal, which is not mm -hmm. to say that they can't bomb uh, a, a federal building in but Oklahoma. One but of the connections is it's not just the people have lost their history, it's that the governments as well have lost their appreciation of history. And so you do, you see a rise of these grievance cultures because Washington in our country becomes detached from the rest of society. The rest of society becomes detached from its history and learning the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the English Bill of Rights, and where all these things, we should have a system of government and natural law and a creator who gives us our rights and more and more people just think it's the government. Um, I want to talk, uh, because you've raised the issue of uh, Trump several times, I want to uh, talk about him. And I want to uh, uh, introduce it by a phrase uh, that uh, the, uh, the great uh, film critic uh, of The New Yorker magazine, Pauline Kael, said uh, in the 1972 election, she didn't understand how Nixon could defeat McGovern. She didn't know anyone who had voted for Nixon. Right. And of course, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, those votes were pretty thin uh, on the ground. Uh, I must say, uh, I have a very diverse set of uh, friends through my lifetime. I grew up in Mississippi. I have a lot of Facebook friends who come from that part of my life, uh, as well as academic friends, former students who are now professors, all, all the rest. I don't think I've ever seen anyone say anything positive about Trump. Uh, and uh, to me, um, but I have read with great interest um, a couple of columns recently, one that was particularly striking by Charles Murray. Did you see yes, that column? Maybe you can say what the column said and then what you thought about it. Um, it, that basically there is a detachment between the elite and and the rest of the country, uh, blue collar workers uh, being held in disdain, and that this is where uh, Trumpism bubbles up from, where the elite never encounter these people. Uh, and I, I yes, I, I kind of think that Charles Murray is, is onto something, but. I live in Macon, Georgia, uh, population 98,000. We know that uh, yeah. mainly because it's the location of the Almond Brothers. Yes, there you go. Yes. Um, and so 98,000 people, middle Georgia, go to an evangelical church, send my kids to a Christian private school, uh, live in an upper middle class neighborhood. I don't know. I mean, maybe I know I can count on one hand Trump supporters. Uh, my boss, I had this conversation with him just the other day, program director for the largest talk station in the country, lives in a heavily Republican area, and he knows one person on a street who supports Trump. And most of my friends are in the same situation. We don't encounter Trump. They don't show up at Republican Party meetings. And demographically, they're not your Republican voter, but they're coming into the Republican Party. Uh, and I guess they have been forgotten about it. One of the annoying trends I, I've, I've observed, really a snotty trend, actually, are the people who write, well, I know Trump people. And they write about how the rest of us don't know Trump people. Therefore, I listen, I'm not in some sort of insulated community. These people just, 
they, they don't exist where I live. I, I guess they do, but who are they? Well, they're 40% of the Republican voters. Yeah, apparently voters. so. Yes. And, uh, so let's turn not to his voters, but to what you think uh, is um, such a problem with Trump. It, my problem with Donald Trump is that until two years ago, he was a Democrat. Uh, he stood on stage in South Carolina and called Planned Parenthood wonderful, and he supported socialist health care. Now, I don't want to support the liberal who supports Planned Parenthood and socialist health care. I don't want to support Hillary Clinton. Uh, a vote between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is a vote between Hillary Clinton and the man who gave Hillary Clinton more money than he's given to all Republicans combined. Uh, I don't believe Donald Trump. Uh, I think Donald Trump will say or do anything to get elected. And if I were to compare and contrast Hillary Clinton, I won't vote for Hillary, but if I were to compare and contrast them, when Hillary Clinton says something, I actually believe that she means it. When Donald Trump says you something... You naive. Well, listen. I, I, oh, listen, my God. When, when Hillary Clinton says that she supports Planned Parenthood, I believe Hillary Clinton on, on that level of issue. Uh, when Donald Trump says something, I think if the wind shifts tomorrow, he will shift as well. Whether you like George Bush or not, and a lot of people, I realize, don't particularly on a college campus, you knew he took the attitude of, damn the polls, I'm going to do what I think is right. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump recognizes right, he recognizes popularity. And that's not leadership to me. I've got a real problem putting the countries in a hand of a man who blows like tumbleweed towards a position based on applause. That's a, uh, that is a position that I think uh, a number of Republicans hold. Just not enough, apparently. Well, actually 60%, but hey, in plurality, who's counting? That's right. But there is another line uh, uh, that I think disturbs a lot of people, and certainly a lot of people I know, which is they see in him a kind of bombastic populist who wants to centralize power. Yes. They see some of the worst features of a kind of Huey Long mm -hmm. and that kind of... i native of Louisiana, yes. Yes. I, I, uh, assassinated Cajun style. Yes, we still um, have the bullet holes to prove it. Yeah. So um, what about that part that he's... Yes, I don't like that either. Um, yep. I don't like the fact that when you get online and say anything dismissive of him, the people who come out most aggressively uh, have white nationalists in their Twitter biography. The fact that he's been able to captivate a grievance culture. I was a political consultant for a long time. I don't believe that you can sustain a campaign on anger. It consumes itself, and if it gets to, to the general election, it's going to be even worse. I, I don't like a presidential candidate who would joke about protesters in the crowd about how they, they could have been beaten up at a different time. Uh, it, it is not a partisan issue for me. I was an elected Republican. I, if I, you don't have to run for president being a jackass. No, it, it, yes. But it seems to help this time. It, apparently it does, because uh, there are so many disaffected people that the idiots in Washington completely ignored. I mean, this is their doing. Trump is their doing. Uh, the fact that both parties, Republican and Democrat, uh, hoard themselves out to the highest bidder instead of doing what they promised based on campaign platforms has a lot to do with the rise of Donald Trump. When politicians don't keep their promises, eventually people have enough of them. Let's talk uh, for a few minutes about uh, the Democratic uh, Party. Um, and Such uh, a more pleasant primary this year. Uh, <laughs> I, what I think I'm, what I'm particularly interested in is your assessment uh, of why, after uh, seven years of the Obama presidency, there's so much anger among Democrats at Washington. From the Republican point of view, there's a pretty ideological president in the White House. Democrats, by the way, don't agree with that. They, they think of him as compromiser and so forth, and you can see some of that in there There's been a lot of, uh, uh, they essentially control the bureaucracies for a, long, for a while during his presidency. They control both houses. Why are Democrats angry? Because they're Democrats. Um, you know, when you start with this is the point where the oceans begin to recede and the world begins to heal, it's all, down, it healed. That's, it's all downhill from there. Um, I, I think that Democrats do look that they had the Congress for two years, they've had the presidency for seven years, and they haven't been able to profoundly shift the country completely in the direction they wanted. 
uh, and so they need to do more. Both parties historically, I believe, uh, and Republicans are as guilty as Democrats. Uh, George Bush in 2005 was very guilty of this level of hubris. They believe they get permanent political majorities. And you hear Democrats talk like that these days. They no longer have to go out and make arguments to the other side. I forget who the, the author was who called it epistemic closure, that they no longer have to engage in debate with the other side. Because That's covered under everyone, Obamacare. Yes, there you go. <laughs> e ev everyone agrees with them already, so they don't have to go make the case, and they're wrong. Uh, By the way, shift. that is one of the single most, I just want to stop for a second, to say that is the single most important reason to be at the University of Chicago as a student instead of Berkeley or Harvard. Just that reason. You have you, one conservative on campus. No. We have among students, and I think that students come into Berkeley, come into Harvard, come into Yale, Columbia you know, our, our peer institutions with a wide range of views. And then essentially they're shamed into right. expressing uh, a variety of views. Uh, and all the professors have a different view in, in the social sciences and humanities. So I think that you need to insist not only on free speech and discourse, but you need to understand if you're the head of the college Democrats that you benefit from having some of the uh, Republicans here to engage you and vice versa. You're going to be better off uh, intellectually if you're engaging with people who are serious, just as smart as you are, have read just as much, thought just as much, and have different views about what works or what, what direction we ought to go, I think you nailed something that is the fundamental defense of free speech mm -hmm. and the fundamental problem when it is, uh, in terms of education, when it is wiped down on college campuses. I, I absolutely agree. And I think the problem that the Democrats have right now is that they just convinced themselves everyone agreed with them, and it turns out that people didn't or they changed their minds and they're not recognizing that shift and Democrats are fighting between going further in a direction or holding to the status quo. It puts Hillary Clinton in a diff difficult position because I think she would like to go further but if she did she would be undermining her relationship to the president and we did have Joe Biden come out and say that he would hold them accountable for distancing themselves from the president. I, I would say you're half right. I would just say that uh, I see just as much uh, epistemic closure among Republicans. Oh, yes. I, I see people who have different views called rhinos, Republican in name. Who the hell would want to call themselves a Republican in name if they weren't a Republican? I mean, what credit is that going to give yeah, you? These days, who would want to call themselves a Republican unless they really meant it? Exactly <laughs> my point. It's yeah. a statement against interest. So you, you've got... Um, uh, I think that this is not a one-sided right. problem. Yeah, and, and you know, the problem, the biggest problem of all of this is that we're reduced to having these conversations typically in a three-minute segment on a TV show, on a I've news TV show. show. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly the way it works. And it's hard to think or talk about these things. And with the rise of social media, I, I let, make part of my, my living on the internet, and I am convinced it is probably the worst invention known to man. I mean, all of us, myself included, it drives out the worst in people. The anonymity on the internet makes the preacher next door a jackass on the internet when he doesn't have to attach his name to it. Uh, it is it it has driven people into tight knit insular bubbles where we're not going across the street and meeting our neighbor across the street. We're going online and meeting someone on Twitter who agrees with us in every which way. Uh, it's one reason, you know, I, ironically in Atlanta, my hobby has become cooking. I grew up in Dubai uh, and grew up to a Cajun mother. So I make gumbo and I try very hard to do cooking schools in Atlanta and invite in people who disagree with me on politics so that we can actually prove to each other you can have wonderful conversations with people who agree with you on politics around a bowl of gumbo uh, or around food. Uh, you can find other things, but particularly people involved in politics, it's become harder and harder to have friendships on the other side. I was at CNN for three years. Some of my very best friends are Donna Brazil and uh, James Carville, and I love them. They are wonderful people. Donna Brazil is family to me. 
and These my are Republican fellow friends, Louisiana. Yes, Donna Brazil, friends of mine are like, I can't believe you like her. Like, she's the great Satan. I mean, no, we. she collects Mardi Gras beads for my kids. and But you don't know what she has to do to get Well, she beads. told me not to ask her, so I'm not going to. Um, but she, she, I mean, she is a, a love of Paul Begala. I, I grew up as a in the 90s, and these were the, the enemies. They were working for both. They're wonderful people. And when you get online and your community becomes like-minded people, faceless yeah. to you except a computer screen, it becomes harder to relate to people. Well, uh, before we go to uh, questions, I'll just say, anybody who brings up gumbo in a speech with me is <laughs> all right. <laughs> About... I've got lots of family in, in New Orleans. Excellent. And my mother was from Mobile. And we used to go visit my grandmother. And uh, we would put on a big, big cast iron pot mm -hmm. of gumbo in the morning. Somebody could watch it while we went out crabbing. And then we would come back with a whole mess of crabs. And we would throw them in, and we would have crab gumbo. Now, I'll tell you how you catch crabs. They can crawl. You can catch there are them kids with a. Here, just, just you so can you know, catch yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, you can catch them with a net. You can get them to come up. And you can catch them with a net. But they can also be caught the same way you catch lobsters. You, they can crawl in to a trap, but they can't crawl out. And I feel that's where we are in America right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll take questions in the back. Uh, we talk about how the Republican Party essentially brought it upon themselves, this whole Trump phenomenon, then, by uh, not fulfilling certain promises. But it seems sort of interesting that the, the Trump supporters aren't able to c give a coherent reason as to why Trump isn't like any other politician. He fights. Uh, right, he fights, right. He's willing to fight. But if anything, he's, a, he's an exaggerated version of a politician willing to sort of say, like yes. you said, whatever people want to hear. What? I mean, is it just the fighting spirit that people are he, He's going to be huge. Uh, he, he'll be great. He'll 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 it'll be it'll be better than you appreciate. Why um, don't yes. people appreciate this hypocrisy? I mean, it really when, is a frustrating experience. When you get scared or mad, and you begin making your decisions based on the the rage in front of you on the emotion, uh, you're going to connect immediately to that emotion. You're not going to you're not going to rationally process, and you're not going to hear it. When people have felt so betrayed for so long by both parties in Washington, and they become so angry, they feel like the world around them is collapsing and the country itself is losing its standing in the world, they're going to go with the bombast. You know, it, I get these questions all the time from people of, oh, we're American Empire, we're the Roman Empire. It's like the collapse of the Roman Empire. No, the Roman Empire was around thousands of years before it ever got to the third century. I would, if I had to pin a moment in Roman history that I think most represents us, it would be the rise of the Gracchi brothers in the Republic, where it was the bombastic men on stage saying that the, the, the tribunes had forgotten them and that it gave rise, which then cascaded to the rise of and Julius Caesar. And then they were Caesar. killed. Yes, they were killed, yes. Uh, but I think we're there. They were a huge populist who attacked the Senate and the Tribune saying they had forgotten about you people and broken all your promises and we'll be huge. And Trump is the Gracchi brothers. The, uh, Let's hope he uh, doesn't end like them, just full disclosure, but, getting recorded. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, David Axelrod is one of the great geniuses of American politics and part of the genius was to package essentially an angry uh, electorate in 2008 um, um, that wanted throw the bums out and to package that as hope and change. Mm -hmm. Well, hope and change was a Rorschach test. Hope for you was different from hope for you. Change for you was different from right. change for you. I think what we've got now is fury and change. That's what I think you're seeing out there is, and they want somebody on the left, they want Bernie to say it. I mean, and Bernie is attacking President Obama, and you're seeing Hillary hug closer and closer uh, so that, because that's her coalition to begin with in the, in the primaries, and then, you know, uh, it won the presidency twice. So. Uh, but there's a fury. There's a fury and change yeah. is what you're saying. And Trump, like Obama and Sarah Palin before him, were empty vessels 
into which everyone could pour their own ideas as to who that person was. And part of the anger, I think, on the Democratic side now is he's not who some of them thought he was, and it's going to burn Trump even more badly than it burned anyone else. Well, you know, there's a story, um, why don't we take the thing, there's a story about people who, yeah, who had uh, go, a man who goes into a, a psychiatrist who's uh, shown uh, Rorschach pictures. He looks at the first one, he doesn't say anything, but he's looking angry. Second one, worse. Third one, the doctor says, you have to say something. The man said, I didn't come here to be shown dirty pictures. <laughs> And I think that there's an element of that in part of our political yes. campaigns. Uh, there are they're these uh, um, ink blots. A and why should, uh, um, in fact, Trump's got a real problem if he explains things, not only because people may depart, may say, oh, I don't like that health care plan, but because as soon as he starts doing it, he sounds like a politician. Yes. Uh, my name's Douglas. First of all, uh, I'm left of center, but I'd love your gumbo recipe anyway. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Happy to give it to you. It's easy. Um, I have a question about Jeb Bush, and then I have a quick comment about Trump, if you'll give yeah, me the please, time. Since please. you live so close to Florida, if you have some inside info on Jeb, you know, what, what did him in, and if there was no There's Trump. exclamation yeah, point. Full disclosure, yeah. yes. I, I love Jeb. Uh, I, he was not my guy, and the reason he wasn't my guy is I thought it was a damning indictment on our republic that after all of this time, the only two candidates America could, could rally around were a Bush and a Clinton, given the rise of so many younger politicians since then. And the um, fact that in the Bush's cases, these, these were not terribly successful presidencies. Yes. I mean, it's not like you're coming in right. after somebody who was agreed to be a big success. Yeah. And, yeah. But I, I like Jeb. His problem was, and I think he contributed a lot to the rise of Donald Trump, is he tried to raise a bunch of money and shut everyone else out in December of 2014 with the I'm thinking about it video on YouTube. And it threw people into a panic who felt like the establishment had rallied around McCain and Romney. We had lost both times. So much was at stake. We had to go out and find someone who could make America great again. Well, here comes a guy who says, I can make America great again, and I hate Jeb Bush. Let's all go with that guy. Um, and he ran, ultimately, a terrible campaign. You know, Democrats who disagree with the Citizens United case should look at what has happened to the Republican Party since then and say, let's keep that case going. <laughs> um, I mean, it has been a disaster for all the Republicans. Interestingly enough, the number one reason being is because the candidates go start these super PACs, they put their best people in the super PACs, and then they go start their campaign. They can no longer talk to the super PAC, and all their best people can no longer talk to them. So what's your comment? Okay. Um there are probably some bugs in this, but think it through. President Obama should offer to sell Guantanamo to Trump for one dollar if he drops out. <laughs> be a hell of a golf course. <laughs> think about it. Thank you. It'd be huge. Um, so uh, here, in the middle. Does the Republican Party believe it can rein in a President Trump? And on the flip side, if Trump sweeps Super Tuesday, will they consider a Supreme Court nomination put forth by President Obama? Actually, I read in the Times today that that actually is on the table. If Trump looks like he's going to be the nominee, they may do it, particularly if the Sandoval trial balloon is legit as opposed to Sandoval's PR people doing it. Uh, I'm kind of convinced it's the Sandoval PR people because he wants to run for Harry Reid's seat. Um, I think it, it, they may very well want to do that. I think if he sweeps Super Tuesday, I, I, I don't know that he can, but if he does, uh, you're going to see a, a huge movement immediately to force Ted Cruz out of the race, not Rubio, and consolidate people. I think you'll see a ton of Ted Cruz people go there. Interestingly enough, the polling that's coming out of um, Georgia and Oklahoma, both Cruz territories now has Rubio ahead. So you're already starting to see people freaking out and abandoning Cruz for Rubio to try to stop that from happening. It's hard for me to understand what Cruz's path, even on the Republican Party, is if he can't win the evangelical vote, which I is agree. his core 
constituency. I agree. Um, if you talk to the Cruz people, though, they are the second choice for Trump people and the second choice for Rubio people. Uh, he is not necessarily the second choice for Rubio. Or, or his people are not necessarily going to go to Rubio. They're going to go to Trump if he were to drop out. So his argument is that more people come to him and build his lead if Rubio drops out than would go to Rubio if, if Cruz dropped out. And he's got ahead in Texas and ahead in California. Um, next question over there. Uh, so you, you kind of commented on the kind of the overpromising and underdelivering in the 2014 elections by a lot of kind of incoming Republicans. Could you give us a little background as to why you think that happened this this cycle and not you know in past cycles? Why was the backlash so strong? And, and why did they promise so much that they did, then didn't follow through on? This because program? they needed to beat conservatives. In 2010, the establishment got their butts kicked by a lot of conservative outsiders. Uh, the Senate Conservatives Fund, the Madison Project, the Club for Growth, Freedom Works, they all ran candidates against incumbents and I think beat more incumbents in the 2010 election uh, than at any other time. And so the establishment working with the Chamber of Commerce brought in candidates who said all the things that the conservatives were saying but were better funded. They got in and they didn't do anything. Uh, then there's the, the lingering impact of the government shutdown in 2013 where, you know, because Ted Cruz did that, the Republicans were not going to take back the Senate in 2014. And then they did. Uh, and I think that left a really bad taste in a lot of conservatives' mouths. Well, uh, explain that last point, because I'd say most people think that the Republicans took back the Senate in spite of what Ted Cruz did, well, not, not because of it. I, I would argue that though the Ted Cruz shut down in 2013, and of course Ted Cruz would say the president did it, not me, but nonetheless, the Ted Cruz shut down in 2013, it had the benefit of exposing how uncommitted Republicans were to fighting Obamacare. Uh, and the fact that they threw him under the bus so quickly, instead of even pretending to stand and fight, uh, exposed them. And in fact, if you talk to people close to Cruz, uh, it did have a tremendous impact in shaking up fundraising for incumbent Republicans in 2014. And I think that lingering anger has, has spilled over. When you've got a party that fundraises off of Trump voters in 2014 saying, we'll stop this, your insurance rates have gone up, your coal mines are closing, we'll take care of you if you vote for us, and they do, and then you do nothing, well, of course they want to burn you down. Over here. Well, uh, I try to formalize my own theory why Donald Trump is winning. Are there, is there any math involved? Uh, no. <laughs> good. Okay, uh, good. But it, it's something that school. could add to the anger and fighting theory you, you have formalized. Uh, because yesterday I read a tweet, and it's very interesting, very lighthearted line. Good, please. Uh, the real issue of our time is loneliness. Trump doesn't make people feel lonely. Maybe tribal, but at least not alone. So that's from the communication study perspective. And this is some sort of retribalization of our society in terms of people, uh, what kind of news they're going to absorb and what kind of uh, you know, things they, wa they want to watch. And that, that's, that's something really interesting. Another one is I read in the morning by Chomsky. He talked about uh, why Trump is winning, the fear, yeah. as well as the breakdown of family mm -hmm. and not, you know, divorce. Well, would you say like something? That. So yeah, what is your ahead. take on that? What is your take on the, this kind of, I think there's a lot of concern out in the country about the kind of breakdown of community. Mm -hmm. And I have a new book out on that, by the way. <laughs> well, why don't you tell it? Why don't you so say something? I, I, I do have a new book. It just came out day before yesterday called You Will Be Made to Care on, on the Rise of um, Forcing People of Faith in This Country to Conform to Secularism. And w w the entire third part of the book is looking at this breakdown in community and, and what particularly uh, Christians in the country can do to rebuild community. So many of them want to pull out of society, build the high wall around the house, cancel the cable, homeschool their kids. And as an evangelical Christian, that's, that's not what our faith says. Uh, Christ said to go, uh, not build a wall and don't go outside. Uh, but there is, I just, I, I got to say this, and, and I'm a partisan. I was an elected Republican. I'm a conservative. I fill in for Rush Limbaugh. There's a dangerous combination of tribalism and nationalism. If you have tribalism and nationalism, it's no longer you're not on our team, it's you're an enemy of mankind. 
I mean, that's, we saw that in the Roman Empire when people, Christians at the time, were being labeled enemies of mankind. And what they meant was, you know, you're either a barbarian or you're a Roman. And if you're an enemy of mankind, you're a barbarian. When you have tribalism mixed with nationalism, you always have something bad happen. And what we're seeing is Trump is connecting into tribalism, but so are other politicians in the country as well. There should be ideas and a competition of ideas and the party should stand for different things and we should class gridlock in washington is a feature not a bug of the system we're supposed to have that clashing the founders wanted it to be extremely difficult to do anything uh, and when we have large populist rise who want to stamp out the gridlock and say you can't do this you're obstructing the will of the people you have to do what i want that's the very thing the founders set up the constitution to make impossible to do if donald trump gets elected it is a failure of us to honor the founders' ideas. I'd like to see if I can get a question or two from somebody who comes at it from a distinctly liberal point of view because, uh, um, uh, because I want to uh, hear an engagement. Naive liberal point of view. How is Donald Trump not a direct result of the abdication of leadership by the Republicans meeting the night of the inauguration of the first president of Obama night, that night when they met in the restaurant and said, we will do nothing to make this man successful. How is this not a complete and linear? Uh, Abdi you know, I would tell you that when you poll Donald Trump supporters, what they say is that they didn't do enough to stop the president. Um, Donald Trump supporters don't like the president. And yeah, they, uh, um, I think uh, uh, one response to that is that in the first two years of the presidency, no matter what they, uh, the Republicans did, they essentially couldn't stop him. So, uh, and, um, but this issue was what um, Eric was just bringing up. The idea that there is gridlock um, is a problem for some people uh, because it means we, quote, can't get anything done. And you're right in saying what Trump is saying is I can cut this Gordian knot by the strength of my force, uh, of, will. Yeah. force of will. And, um, and so uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, but um, But... There are other people who say, if that's the way the knot's going to be cut, I'd rather see the knot stay in place. Yeah, I, I think that the Trump supporters I encounter on my talk radio show feel like the Republicans betrayed them on immigration by not standing up to the president. They feel like the Republicans betrayed them on health care by not standing up to the president. The Republicans betrayed them on financial budgetary issues by not standing up to the president. Uh, and all my Democratic friends say, well, they obstructed and obstructed and obstructed. And the Trump people say, well, they didn't obstruct enough. Uh, and so now they want a guy to go to Washington who half the, he contradicts himself within sentences, uh, within in clauses of sentences. And they just want to get something done. I did an undecided voter uh, focus group in Atlanta for my radio show. Brought in 40 people. They were all completely undecided. Worked with the pollster to find them that, for the Republican primaries. Brought 20 undecided of them back. Among uh, Republicans, yeah, undecided were, Republicans. 40 uh, undecided Republicans. Uh, brought them back, 20 of them. Of the 20, one of them had decided for Trump. And I asked him, does it concern you as a Republican that Trump was a Democrat for so long and has had democratic policy positions until now. And he said, no. Why? I said, do you believe him? He says, no. I said, so why are you supporting him? Because he'll make Washington work again. And I said, what if Washington doesn't work in your favor? And he actually literally said, at least it'll be working. Um, I find that should scare you all, by the way. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a train run on time argument. Yes. And it's, a, it, it's very uh, troubling. Uh, I, I think that uh, the biggest issue, uh, not the big immediate issues like immigration and uh, Supreme Court appointments and all of that, but the big issue 
that I think uh, the Democratic Party has not come to grips with is the following. The, the, there's been a long arc from FDR uh, to uh, LBJ and now to Barack Obama. There have been, uh, and most Republicans, with the exception of Reagan, were largely elected within that large arc. Eisenhower was more conservative, to be sure, than, than Stevenson would have been. Uh, Nixon, many of the current great society type programs were actually insti uh, instituted under Nixon, right? EPA right. and so forth. Uh, uh, and only really Reagan uh, against that. We've spent trillions since the Great Society, something on the order of 20 trillion, to solve basic problems of poverty in the country. And we've solved some. We no longer have elderly poverty. Those of us who are older in the room can remember those TV uh, uh, reports where there would be older people eating dog food, you know, trying to just get by. And we've solved that. But if you look at the riots in Baltimore, if you look at uh, the open free fire zone on the south and west sides of Chicago and so forth, these were the problems that those $20 trillion were designed to solve. And those problems look as serious today as when, or, uh, as when the programs were proposed in the mid-60s, and in some cases, as in out-of-wedlock births, they look much more serious. They're not only minority uh, problems. People sometimes think they are. They're problems, as Charles Murray has written eloquently about, that involve uh, uh, less educated whites as well. So there is very serious problems. And I think that the big problem confronting uh, the Democratic Party on the domestic side is given that we put so much money into these programs and the problems haven't been solved, what do you think, even if we could afford to up them 10%, 20%, why would that make anything any different? Why would that improve any of these really awful, serious social problems that are endemic in the community. I think the, Republican, uh, the Republicans have answers to that, but they are not perceived as being sympathetic fundamentally to the people suffering right. those problems. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point. Uh, you know, I, I, so many conservatives these days as well get confused with libertarians. I, I'm not a libertarian. Uh, I actually believe that there has to be a social safety net. Uh, there are things, I think, that we have to cut in government. Um, but how to relate that then to people that you will be benefited by getting Washington out of your way. And the rise, I, I think, of this thing we're seeing right now on the Republican side is you have a leave me the hell alone coalition that really does want Washington to leave them alone. And they're trying to decide do we go with the guy who's going to burn it all to the ground or with a reformer who's going to promise for a while it's going to leave us alone? So on college campuses, there's a huge social justice concern. What do you say to somebody who says um, the Republican Party has no answers um, to those very real concerns? I would say that I am a conservative because I'm a Christian. I think that we're all sinners, and I want as few in charge of me as possible. And the rise of a social justice movement presumes that there can be some benevolent, benign someone to redistribute and provide justice to them uh, in a way that is not individual to individual, contractually or criminally established needs for justice, but because of the demands of society. Life is not fair. Uh, I think that society itself does need to recognize there are people who have fallen behind and do need answers, and we should not presume in every case that the police are the benevolent society that they claim to be, uh, but we should have law, we should have order, and there should be a process by which to have those grievances answered and addressed other than protesting in the streets and shutting down other people. I think that's said as eloquently as possible. Let's take one last uh, uh, 
Uh, well, let's take two. Uh, you and then you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, with the possibility that there, real possibility of a Trump Sanders election, um, how important either are independents going to play in it at, or an independent race because of the news that Bloomberg might run? How is that going to play a role? Is that even a, oh, legitimate, I, I think so. a legitimate possibility? You think if, so? What? Yeah, I'm if, sorry. You, if you see a Trump mm. Sanders race, I think you'll probably see multiple third party candidates. I think you will see someone running as the carrying the banner of the Democratic Party and someone running carrying the banner of the Republican Party who are not Sanders and Trump. That's really fascinating. Uh, do you think that would end up in the House of Representatives? It could. Republican for the win, then. I mean, let's see, we can laugh about that, but the, given the, the gerrymandering in, in the states, the Senate, the Republicans of the Senate may be toast, but the Republicans of the House will probably keep their majority. Well, let me just tell you, if uh, in that, um, in that we may probabilistic situation, I've got to tell you, uh, that uh, uh, not electing uh, a republic, somebody who ran as a Republican nominee, if uh, that person received a, uh, more votes than any other Republican in the race, the, the person elected might have been done so by constitutional methods, but would not be right. perceived as a legitimate. Uh, I totally uh, agree with that. Right. But we're talking about the Republicans in Washington making decisions. Yeah. <laughs> so, Last question. So if you were advising the four remaining presidential candidates how to stop Trump, assuming I think they would agree with you, he doesn't represent Republican values, and they do believe in that, would you say, one, they should each go negative, which if, you know, Rubio did that and Cruz did that, it may push each up to 30%, Trump down to 20. Nobody wins on the first ballot, but it ends up much better than Trump winning. So go negative, articulate what it means to be a Republican as you started to, free trade, et cetera, which Trump doesn't believe in at all, all those 10 things. Argue uh, you know, that those Republican values are not Trump, as you said, until the last year or two. And last, consolidate probably from four to one, probably to Rubio, and hope you can do that in a way that the voters for Trump see this was not going to be a good thing, so they don't start a third party. Is that, is that I, any, have I you would, got a better solution? Yeah, I would disagree with you on one thing. I don't think you have to run ads on Trump not being a Republican because I think his supporters don't care. Um, but you do have to run attack ads. Listen, the rules of politics don't suddenly not apply to Trump. They just haven't been applied to Trump. Of the $300, $400 million in negative ads, only 9% have been run against Donald Trump. He got a free pass in New Hampshire because everyone had to take out Marco Rubio. He slid into South Carolina and had the debate faux pas. And what happened? His polling actually did incredibly decline when they started kicking the snot out of him in ads. Just they didn't have enough time to make it happen. So yes, you have to run negative ads against Donald Trump. And the way you run negative ads against Donald Trump is you run the ads that show that he abused his power to take advantage of the little guy. And there are ample stories of that. The eminent domain story being first and foremost, uh, using illegal immigrants and then treating them badly in his buildings. You use that. Uh, and yes, um, Ben Carson does have to wake up from the pipe dream where he sees himself in the mirror calling himself president of the United States. And the biblical donkey hole from Ohio does have to eventually go home. Uh, and so you leave this between K uh, Trump and Rubio and Cruz. And actually, if you left it between Trump, Rubio and Cruz, they probably probably could sort it out. Now, my personal position that I've been advocating for the last two days is that if the polling in your state, if you're a Rubio supporter, has Cruz ahead, vote for Cruz. And if the polling in your state has Rubio ahead and you're a Cruz supporter, vote for Rubio. Because the goal right now is to deny Trump delegates to the Republican convention. And then once you've dispatched him, then you Cruz and Rubio people can kill each other. But you can't kill each other until you've taken out Donald Trump. So you, you disagree in thanking you, I just want to say. You disagree with that uh, ad that I just saw today where there was a man in the street interview and I think it was the Pope saying he disagreed with. You know, while I, theologically, I'm, I'm, I grew up Southern Baptist, I'm Presbyterian, I, I'm, listen, if, if you're a preacher supporting Donald Trump, you may need to go back to seminary. Um, <laughs> When, when you have a candidate for president who calls himself a great Christian, 
who says, I've read the Bible more than anyone, and yet has felt no need to ever repent, has no favorite Bible verse, and thinks his book is better than Jesus' book. You probably need to go back to seminary, Robert Jeffries, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., uh, before backing a guy who, listen, it, my ultimate pitch against Donald Trump that nearly got me in trouble yesterday on TV is how can a voter say this guy's going to be faithful to me when he hadn't been faithful to multiple women whose bed he shared and he doesn't share your bed? Um, um, I that's believe a with that, that was actually the title of one of my favorite country music songs. Yes. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was fun. That was fun.